You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you from the second China International Import Expo in Shanghai. When politicians build walls, those with commerce in mind are trying to build bridges. During my discussion with the California delegation at the expo, I found that bridges are not only being built, but are also strong enough to endure the headwinds and storms. And in that regard, people-to-people -people relations are the key. Mr. Carson, Mr. Pound, what a pleasure to see you here. Good to see you, too. Thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us. I know there are a lot of things going on as a result of a technology development. And Mr. Carson, one of your job is to try to prepare the population in your area for that. How is that working together with your cooperation with China? Well, we have basically about 280 businesses that are located in the region that I represent that uh, hire American as well as foreign-born workers, but they're headquartered, the, the offices are headquartered in China. And so that relationship, which has been built up over years, is the reason for us to be here uh, yet again in China. Mm. But how do you think technology mm -hmm. are bringing all the challenges and also opportunities to the businesses that are based in your area? In that regard, what does China mean? Well, China is also an equivalent, if you will, around technology, if you look at it in terms of around the world. There's Silicon Valley, and then there's also China. And so we realize that the cooperation and the working relationship and the sharing of information to, a level, to an extent is, is very important for both of us, both in California as well as in China. Mm. And Mr. Pan, what about that for you? You know, how the technology development is bringing in another layer of challenge, but maybe another layer of opportunity between China and California. I totally agree uh, because of the te technology. Now people can, you can just go to the computer to find out more information about the different uh, culture, different kind of uh, uh, environment mm -hmm. of China. This is a good thing for, uh, for the U.S. Um, over the years, we have um, uh, organized a lot of uh, delegation uh, with the elected officials to visit China. And in fact, as a matter of fact, for this year, do, this will be my ninth trip over the years, working together with uh, Chinese uh, association uh, with a foreign country, uh, Qingguo Yuxie, you know, mm -hmm. that we work very closely together. It's very important for this business that for people-to-people -people relations to be strengthened, mm. particularly at this critical time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carson, uh, what does that mean? Do you have to be more creative in terms of how you form the delegation, how you be able to communicate back at home about the purposes of the trips, and, and what does that take? Well, one has to keep in mind that one of the largest populations of Asians outside of China is located in Northern California, right, right in our area. And so individuals are our neighbors, our friends, we've known for a long time, a part of our community, a part of our family. It's, it doesn't take a lot of explanation on that part why should we should continue that relationship with China. With respect to business, with respect to uh, medicine, with respect to education, there's also been those exchanges and interactions that have been natural over the last uh, 10, 20, 30 plus years. And so again, it doesn't need a lot of explanation. What our purpose now is to make sure that we let the world know that we're continuing that relationship, that continued, it, continuous interaction that we've always had uh, with, uh, with China and people of Asian descent. But Mr. Pang, you know, talking about the relationship, you personally went through also the ups and downs of the bilateral relations between China and the United States over the decades. So what do you make of the current stage? Is it a teacup, a storm in the teacup, or is it a real storm to come? Well, to me, I don't think there's any hiccup. Um, I think the people-to-people -people relationship on the sub-national uh, um, level is very important. So to bring both people in two different cultures, two different countries, or many, you know, we believe in diversity. So by doing so, that have more U.S. Um, uh, friends understand about China, and they will see witness uh, personally by themselves instead of 
just read from the media what's going on. Mm. This, I, th I thought it was more effective in that manner. Are there sharp contrasts as to what they really see and what they really read? Oh, definitely. When they uh, arrive uh, to visit China after, in fact, many of them after the second days, uh, because most of our trip, the delegation members, uh, never been to the U.S. I mean, sorry, never been to China, and they will see that oh my God, it's, it's totally different from what they perceive and what they read. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, um, a couple of them even thought that uh, China is still um, in the old days and the Cold War. You know? They say when they see it, they say yeah. it's totally different. But now for Mr. Carson, who has been here many times. I've been here uh, over the last 20 years. I, I can't count how many times that I've been here. But uh, last year I was at the International Trade Show as well here. And this year I see even more presence of U.S. companies that are here, especially the major companies. There's still that presence here. So while people may think that the trade uh, discussions right now have kind of put a stop to that, uh, that is still happening and is very visible here with that presence. In addition to that, the Port of Oakland just released within the last 30 days a public report that says that their uh, shipment and their tonnage is still up as high as it's been the last couple of years. So while those merchandise and while the things that they're shipping in may be in, uh, in the pipeline and might have been orders that are backed orders, they're still coming through, uh, they're still taking place. Uh, again, I think we're reinforcing that not only with our business community but with our community in general that our relationships are our relationships and uh, no person is an island and we can't do it alone and we understand that from a historical perspective yeah but you have to be patient right in a way uh, to see whether we are going to the right direction but at the same time making a lot of efforts too what do you think would be the most effective way one-on-one -on -one conversations, having individuals come here, exchanges and exchanges not just of uh, individuals coming here but also more individuals from China coming from all different walks of life, not necessarily just because of the academic opportunities that are there or business opportunities, but again we, we grow greater together when we're exchanging medical thoughts and ideas and challenges, when we talk about education, when we talk about family and family structure and we find out that we're all the same. Mm. Are you afraid that we might go back to the Cold War or similar to Cold War situation? I'm afraid that uh, the administration has put, uh, has been pumping the brakes on a lot of things that have taken place over the last 200 years that it took to develop, uh, not just in terms of Chinese and American relationships, uh, but in terms of internal relationships that we've had, the struggles that women have had for right, equal rights, the struggle that other people of color have had for equal rights, all of those things have been challenged in the last two years. But again, having that one-on-one -on -one relationship, continuing to interact, continuing to dialogue, I think that, that beats out uh, tweets and it beats out the ongoing coverage that might happen every single night coming out of Washington. Every step of the way, every effort that needs to be made in order to make it happen. Mr. Pang, Sim? Yes, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Carson mm. on this view because um, through my many trips to China on both business trips and also official delegation trip, I one of my conclusions is that in Chinese we all say, Ni xin zhong yu wo, wo xin zhong yu ni. When you have a better understanding, uh, more interaction, I think so people to people relationship, in my opinion, mm. is very, very important. Yeah. Wait, the relationship still uncertain at this point. Mm. What do you think could be the potential of people to people relations? Because it could also be vulnerable as a result of federal policies. So what do you think can still be done? And what can you do to prevent or preempt some of the more nationalistic or uh, ri rivalry, rival kinds of uh, policy or approaches, Mr. Carson? Well, let me talk about what we're actually doing back home in, in, in Northern California. Uh, the various faith-based communities are, are having more cross-faith-based discussions and interactions and talking about these issues. So it's not just them staying within their own particular faith, but they're sharing their uh, church, their synagogue, uh, their temple with other religions in order to foster a better relationship and understanding. The same thing is happening in our educational system. 
in our in our high schools, our K through 12, they're having a lot more dialogue and discussion about it as opposed to being fearful about what they hear. Let's talk about it and understand it a lot more. And so I think that that's happening within our community organically without necessarily always wanting to or organize something. It's happening organically. And again, I want to go back to what I said earlier. That's all be that's because for years and years we've been living amongst each other and already sharing these kinds of interactions. Mm, it's genetic already. It's genetic. Yeah, That's exactly. True. Mr. Khan? Yes, I told you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think over the years, um, I would say that, uh, as you know, I'm from Singapore and I used to live and work in China uh, from 86 to 89. Yeah. Uh, I always tell my friends that I personally witness and also participate in uh, uh, the growth of China over the last 40 years. Uh, over the years, I see that a lot of uh, advancement in terms mm. of education, in terms of, uh, I mean, banking. You know, and, and a lot of co my customers say that, uh, frankly, they they like this uh, 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 um, tariff. I ask them why you like the tariff. He said it's better off for them as an importer in the states because they will, you know, uh, clear clear up a lot of. Uh, op you know, uh, other importers were doing the same thing. So <laughs> to him, it's better. But on the <laughs> other hand, silver lining on everything. <laughs> you can tell, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it's such a wonderful thing to yeah. see both of you here. Yeah. And let's keep up. All the best. Thank, Thank you. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei, go beyond the headlines. You're watching World Insight, I'm Tian Wei. The program is coming to you from Shanghai, this time at the second China International Import Expo. The world has become increasingly aware of the huge buying potential of the Chinese market. That is why this import expo has seen some golden opportunities, particularly by the multinational companies. On the sidelines of CIIE in Shanghai, I talked to Grant Reed, who is the CEO of the confectionery maker Mars Incorporated. Let's hear his views as an American global manufacturer. Mr. Reed, what a pleasure to see you at CIIE. It's great to be here. Many wonder why would you spend so much time and energy here? I mean, as a global CEO, you have to travel and your schedule is hectic. Yeah, I can't think of a better place to be. You know, we've been in uh, China for uh, over 30 years. The Expo is a great opportunity to uh, show our support for all of our associates who work in China, show some of the great innovations that are on the way. and you know, be part of the Chinese community and uh, work with our stakeholders. So it's a great use of time. Mm. But of course, uh, at this moment, there are a lot of things going on. Besides business as usual, there are a lot of unusual things. Yes. Uncertainties for businesses around the world is one of those most important factors. So how you, are you looking at business and uncertainties? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we've, we've been a family business. Uh, for over a hundred years. So in, in China, we're leader in pet care, leader in confectionery. So we're used to going through a lot of uncertainty and it's part of our DNA. We have five principles. We love change. Uh, so we recognize... I hope it's good change that you Yeah, love. It, it usually is. You know, I think you can get the positive out of anything if you look hard enough. And, you know, we, our job is to meet the needs of our consumers and that's what we do every day. Mm. So how with a hundred years of experience, yes. are you going to deal with politics? I mean, what is the best way? Because it's not just about whatever politics is like and then you have to bear with it, but rather how would you make your voice heard and also yeah. how would you work with the circumstances in a way? Yeah, so we, we as I said, we focus on policy and not politics. And we believe in That's global trade. Point. You know, we believe in a free, free trade between countries uh, and that's, that's our voice. Uh, at the same time, we work within the, you know, the political environment and the uncertainty that exists and try and find opportunities within that. So it's mm. pretty straightforward, really. I think if you like change, 
then uh, you know you can take advantage of some of these opportunities. Mm. If you look at some of the rise of nationalism in some countries, and that would have an impact on consumer habits. So yeah. how do you see the interactions between all of these important and probably complicated bad factors? Yeah, I, I think that, I think it's a bit of a dichotomy. There's really two things going on. Tell me about that. There's globalization on the one hand, and there's localization mm. on the other. And a good example of that would be localization would be what uh, Mars has done in China on high quality, high olate peanuts. We spent 10 years working with farmers in China to produce high quality peanuts to go in our M&Ms. Mm. So that's a great example of working with local authorities, local farmers to create new quality products that are grown here, right here in China. Mm. At the same time, there's opportunities to import products from different parts of the world to test in China with the consumer and if they're successful then we bring them in here. So there's globalization, localization and the two things work synergistically. How do you see the changes, whether it's as a result of geopolitics, mm -hmm. trade war or just the global supply chain and economic restructuring? The dramatic changes taking place right now. Global yeah, there's, I mean, there's changes in everything. You know, it's not just. Or am I wrong? No, maybe no, it, you're maybe it's not. It's only superficial. Is it real change or only temporary change? I, I, I think there's always, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Right? All those things intermix, and our job uh, as a corporation is to try and manage those. And uh, it's not just political uncertainty. It's climate change. It's, uh, as you said, sugar use. All of those things we have to manage, and that's, that's part of the job. For example, your product, right? Yes. Uh, there are global supply chain changes in the Asia Pacific region, for example, China US trade war, and then you got Vietnam, and even though it's geographically much smaller than China, so nobody says it's going to replace China, but still it's going on. So, yep. And some of the other countries as well, how much is having an impact on you? It's global supply chain, okay? Yeah. Not only China, but also in other parts of the world, uh, yeah. Brexit, and you know, Latin America, all of these uh, stuff going on. So how does, what does that mean, the global supply chain changes uh, as you see it? I'll give you an example of, of to make chocolate, you need cocoa. Coke is only grown in certain regions, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, etc. So that's a part of a global supply chain. We have to have the ability to move those products around the world. In most cases, we try and develop local supply so that we're developing it in country. And we've done that, as I mentioned, in China. So it's the globalization. We try and keep it as local as possible unless we have to, there's an opportunity or a specific requirement to have it global. Uh, talking about uh, Latin America, of course, it's vulnerable to climate change. We have seen some of the recent uh, crises, whether it's fires or other uh, things in uh, Latin America and North America as well. So how do you prepare for that? Do you have already alternative plans as a business, as you said, already a hundred years? I'm sure you have some ways of dealing with it. What are the ways? What yes. are the examples? So the, fir the first, I'd say the most important thing we can do is to bring our voice to the debate, which I think we've, we've done. So we have our su Sustainable in a Generation uh, program. And what we try to do is we try and take a leadership position, but we don't do it on our own. Nobody can you know, defeat uh, climate change on their own. So we try and work with other companies. We've done that with the Consumer Goods Forum. We do it with NGOs. We do it with uh, governments to try and cut our CO2 emissions. So we, we cut our own emissions and we try and make sure that we have a voice on uh, you know, talking to yourself and others around the climate change. We believe the science is real and we have to do something about it. But what about the raw materials you're using? I mean, that is probably more directly a question I want to ask you. Yes. That is uh, cocoa, for example. Yeah. Some of the areas might be influenced by the impact of the climate change. While you are trying to prevent climate change by using you know, winds, Yes. Uh, as the energy source, but there's also adaptation of climate change. That is the global supply chain part of the question that I want to address you about. Yeah, so, so cocoa, for example, as, it, as climate change occurs, then it's going to get hotter and hotter, and, and the production will move further and further north. Um, and we have to be ready for that. So we, ha we have a memorandum of understanding with the Cote d'Ivoire government. We work with the Ghana uh, Cocoa uh, Exchange. So we try and work with the uh, uh, legislators in the geographies to make sure we're managing some of these and work with them because we, we can't do it on our own.
all the changes in agricultural technology because a lot of your products have to come from there and also the applications of some of the IT technology, yes. AI and others included, on the consumer side, right? So there's a whole supply chain of yes, change absolutely. and the application change. So they are also going parallel with one another. It's not just one side. It's all at the same time. Yes. How would you understand that change and the interactions among them? No, I think you're, you're right. Look at the next generation, millennials, Gen Z, they're, they're looking for more transparency and similarly the, uh, there's more transparency, use of internet, social media, there's much more information available. So it's, it, that creates an environment where one, they're looking for companies to see what, what do they do, are their brands doing something positive for society, are they putting something back into the ecosystems in which they operate, mm -hmm. that's one side of it. On the other side, you know, the technology is providing massive opportunities to, to change the way that you do business and you know if you go down to our expo booth you're going to see you know all kinds of new digital technologies that we're using but it's not just with the consumer yeah. if you go to our factories we're using artificial intelligence to determine when a machine may break down rather than waiting for it to break down to fix it at the same time we're looking at how do we improve our distribution programs mm -hmm. and make uh, our retail outlets easier to work with using technology so it's And that's all we have for today. From Shanghai at the second China International Import Expo, I'm Tian Wei. You'll find our special coverage from our YouTube channel and also from our Twitter and Facebook accounts. On behalf of my team here in Shanghai and back in Beijing, thanks for watching and bye for now.